afternoon, everyone. Welcome to this philosophy department sponsored event marking Constitution Day 2021, which happens to be September 17th. My name is Daniel Cullen. Our explicit topic today is the constitution of knowledge, but you'll see that James Madison has something to do with that, that one as well. I'd like to begin by thanking the Jack Miller Center for Teaching America's Founding Principles and History for sponsoring this event and the Thomas W. Smith Foundation. And profuse thanks to Shanti Smythe and Nikki Moore, our tech support guardian angels who are hovering invisibly in the background. It's one thing to have guardian angels, but to get their cell phone numbers as well is next level guardian angelship. I'll start with a few uh, instructions, which I'll otherwise forget. You're invited to submit questions at any time through the Q&A function. So the chat is turned off. I know you love it, but uh, it won't be on. Please type your questions as pithily as possible through the Q&A function. Uh, that's as authoritarian as we'll, as we'll get, although we may have turned off the reaction buttons as well, so there won't be any dopamine rushes this afternoon. The first part of uh, our program will be uh, a presentation by our speaker and a little bit of conversation with, with me. And then we'll hear some commentary from uh, James R. Stoner, who is the Herman Moyes Jr. Professor of Political Science at LSU, where he also directs the Eric Vogelin Institute. Jim is a leading scholar of American constitutionalism, English common law, political philosophy, the author of numerous books, too many uh, to mention, but I'll, I'll just mention common law liberty and the common law and liberal theory. Also commenting will be Rebecca Tuvel, chair of the philosophy department at Rhodes College and therefore my boss. Her interests include feminist philosophy, ethics, meta-ethics, race and racism. I could go on. Her forthcoming book is Changing Race on the Ethics and Metaphysics of Transracialism. Our guest today is Jonathan Rausch, senior fellow at the Brookings Institution, a renowned author, public intellectual, award-winning magazine writer. He is, he is a terrific wordsmith. I won't mention his, his numerous uh, works because it's, it's better to hear from him than hear about him. His latest book is The Constitution of Knowledge. A defense of truth. John, this is your third visit to Rhodes College. I'm happy to tell you, you are only now three credits away from a philosophy minor. It kills me that we couldn't have you here in person. Uh, Memphis is opting for herd immunity the old fashioned way, but as soon as possible, we'll, uh, you'll be able to cash in your, your rain check. So a defense of truth, if truth needs a defense, it must be under attack. By whom, toward what end? Well, first and foremost, thank you so much, uh, Professor Cullen, for having me back. Uh, third time now along and deep and cherished relationship with, with Rhodes College. <clears throat> and apologies for burr in my throat. It's not COVID. It's just too much book talking. So the subtitle of my book, to avoid repeating a word, is defensive truth, but it's really a defensive knowledge and how we make knowledge. What I'll do in the next maybe 10 minutes or so is just put on the table the three big points of the book so that we can move to discussion, which I think is, is where the, the meat of the conversation will be. And there are three big points to this book in the order I'll present them. Number one, it's not just a marketplace of ideas, it's a constitution of knowledge. Number two, you're being manipulated. And number three, they're not 10 feet tall, we are. So start with number one. 
if you ask Americans where knowledge comes from, how we reach truth in the United States or in the realm of, say, science and learning, the answer you'll usually get is it's a marketplace of ideas. And that's a great answer. I love it. I use it all the time. It's a metaphor that dates back 102 years now to a dissenting Supreme Court opinion by Oliver Wendell Holmes. But if you present that to an undergraduate, the first thing she will say is, well, what's the guarantee that in the marketplace of ideas, the best ideas will surface? I mean, after all, computer, consumers buy a lot of junk food. Now, that's a very profound question. And the standard answer is, well, you know, it all, it all comes out in the wash. It's, we have critical debate and it all works out in the long run. It's not a very compelling answer. And, and there's a reason for that, which is we now know a lot about human psychology and cognition. And we know that in an unstructured environment, people don't actually look for truth in an objective systematic way. What they try to do is seek ideas and actually believe things. In fact, their cognition, what they perceive will be tuned to a couple of things. One is what will advance their standing in the group or tribe? What are the people around me believing? Um, how do I tune myself to that? And, and second, how do I confirm my biases and my high opinion of myself? This isn't even a conscious operation, but it leads us to search for things that confirm our biases. We agree with our, our neighbors, our friends. We're pretty good at you know short-term rapid feedback questions like, is that a tiger in the bush or a breeze? But we're not good at all at more abstract questions like, like what is it that's killing our children? What is this disease? For that sort of thing, it's, you know, did you, did you see that woman? Did you see how she looked at me? She's a witch, burn her. That's the kind of thing we come up with. And then someone else says, it wasn't that witch over there. It was the heretic over here. And then we go to war. Then we start killing each other and we live in oppression, war and ignorance for the first 200,000 years of human history. We have something a little bit like that in the social media world right now, which is a similarly unstructured tribal epistemic environment with similarly dismal results. What got us out of that? You know, 300, 350 years ago, some people came up with a radical idea, not coincidentally, some of the same people at the same time who came up with free markets, Adam Smith, and the US Constitution, Republican democracy, James Madison. They said, instead of having rulers who decide what's gonna be true for public purposes, let's have rules. Let's farm our knowledge, our truth-seeking system, not to individuals or sacred texts or oracles or priests or prints. Let's have a big network of people who will look for each other's errors constantly, all the time, and do that in a structured way. So they're forced to be civil to each other. They have to make rational arguments. They have to present evidence. They have to follow two key rules. One is no final say. No one gets to shut down the argument, declare what's true, and put anyone in jail who disagrees with them. That's where we get freedom of speech, marketplace of ideas. The other rule, just as important, the empirical rule, no personal authority. Whatever I do to establish my case, whatever evidence I deduce, whatever logic I use, has to be able to convince anyone else who looks at it, in theory. Dan Cullen, Rebecca Tuvel, you, anybody. It's what that rolling consensus of many individuals and institutions talking over time develops, that's knowledge, not what any particular person believes. This turns out to be a species transforming system. It takes us to a world where we are literally learning in a morning more than the human species learned in its 200,000 years because literally millions and millions of minds all over the world can plug into this reality building network in an interoperable way, talk to each other, exchange ideas, look for errors, and find those needles of truth in the haystack of falsehood. It's a fantastic system, but it depends on a lot of rules and procedures. It is not self-ordering. That's why I call it the constitution of knowledge. There are a lot of things you have to set up and they look a lot like the US constitution. How do we get rid of our biases? We pit bias against bias, just like in Madison's constitution, we deal with ambition by pitting ambition against ambition. How do we prevent uh, takeovers by dictators or authorities? Well, we distribute power in the constitution of knowledge. There's no one person or authority that can decide. It's spread out as in the US constitution. We spread powers among three branches at the federal level and then multiple branches, state, local, federal. We have checks and balances in both systems, we have to check each other. You have to persuade people that you're right in order to establish knowledge and the constitutional knowledge, and you have to compromise with people in order to pass legislation 
make law in the US constitution. I could go on. They're parallel after parallel. The real, the biggest difference is that one of these constitutions happens to be written down and the other isn't. But you've got to understand and protect and defend all those constitutional norms and institutions that keep us moored to reality and allow us to settle our disputes civilly and peacefully. It's not just a marketplace, it's a constitution of ideas. The bulk of the book, the reason I think it'll last, you know, 5,000 years and put Plato and Aristotle in the shade, is that the book really tries to explore the constitution and all. What is it, how it works? It's not just a metaphor. I think it's a real regime ordering how we deal with each other in society. Point number two, you're being manipulated. The constitution of knowledge has always had enemies. It always will, you know, ever since the time that, you know, the Catholic church put Galileo under house arrest. Uh, and that's nothing new. Uh, we're just going to have to deal with that. The book focuses on two primary enemies right now, and they have something in common, which is they're using what experts call information warfare. I tend to call it epistemic warfare. But this is about manipulating the media and information environment for political advantage, specifically to uh, disorient, dominate, divide, and ultimately demoralize your target population. So there's a lot to say about how that's being done and by whom. For purposes of brevity, two big categories, two big buckets. Category number one, seen predominantly on the right, um, disinformation. These are tactics like the so-called fire hose of falsehood. Uh, it's uh, something the Russians done. You flood the airwaves, uh, every channel with, with so much uh, misinformation, half-truth, exaggeration, conspiracy theories, the media can't keep up. No one knows what's true or false anymore. Uh, this is a tactic that was adapted by Donald Trump with brilliant success, as his advisor, Stephen Bannon, famously said. We know how to deal with the media. We just flood the zone with shit. Effective, sophisticated stuff. There's others. Conspiracy bootstrapping, for example. That's what Trump is doing when he says, you know, I hear people say so-and-so. Well, then he puts it out in the media who either have to cover it and deny it and therefore recirculate it or overlook it and therefore seem to implicitly accept it. Trolling, that's attention hijacking. That's why Trump is saying those outrageous things. He knows that we can't help but obsessing. It's how we're wired when people attack our friends, our reputations, our sacred beliefs. These are the tactics that now have a majority of Republicans believing the election was stolen in 2020. This is very, very dangerous stuff for our country. I won't linger on it, but we can talk about it. The second major pathway though is one used predominantly by the left. I should emphasize both left and right can use all of these tactics and have throughout history and no doubt will. This is a tactic that some people call cancel culture. Uh, it involves social coercion and also manipulating the perceived consensus around us. So we naturally want to agree with people in our community if we're the only one who believes something and people think that's screwy or immoral, we'll tend to try not to believe it. We'll back away from it, we'll silence ourselves, our cognition itself will be influenced by that. So suppose you can use social media or conventional media, or you can weaponize course evaluations, or you can launch investigations on a college campus if someone says something that you think should not be said or that you shouldn't have to hear. Well, it doesn't take much of that to create a chilled environment on campus. And we see that now. About two thirds of students in America say that there are things that they will not talk about on campus for fear of social ramifications. Um, I'm hearing much the same from, from many professors. This kind of information warfare operates on two levels. One is simple repression, right? People are just reluctant to speak out because they're afraid they'll get in trouble. But it also operates on a deeper level because if a fairly small group of activists on a campus can get other people to silence themselves, they can manipulate the apparent consensus. So it will seem like everyone or most people on campus except maybe a small group of Federalist Society, agree with them. And remember, we tune our beliefs and even our perceptions to what we think other people believe, so we get spoofed by this. So a small minority typically on campus is able to convince people that they speak for the majority. They're able to dominate the information environment in order to demoralize their opponents. And that's the ultimate goal. Demoralization is political demobilization. We're seeing a lot of that on campus. Of course, we're seeing it on social media and we're seeing it in everyday life. We've all heard the stories. Big point number three, they're not 10 feet tall, we are. So what do we do about this? Number one, it's not a magic bullet. It's gonna be all of society responding many institutions in many ways. 
Number two, you're never going to get rid of disinformation and cancel culture. Tocqueville described cancel culture in the United States in 1835. He said it was the biggest threat to freedom. John Stuart Mill described it in Victorian England in 1859. He said it was the greatest threat to freedom. Nothing new about it. What we have to learn to do is do a better job of containing it and immunizing ourselves. Uh, the good news is that a lot of institutions are beginning to do that work. Social media is figuring out how to redesign its platforms. We're seeing institutions arise that can provide guardrails, set codes of conduct. That worked in the past. Facebook is doing that with its oversight board. International Association of Fact Checkers is getting set up. We're seeing academic centers that are studying disinformation, learning how to cancel it, finding these false theories before they can go viral. Governments are wising up. Individuals and the media are much smarter about disinformation and canceling and how to deal with them. So we're gradually beginning to see responses. Um, and that's the key because I try to tell people I'm hopeful, not necessarily optimistic. We have to understand that there is a constitutional knowledge and we have to then defend it. It doesn't take care of itself any more than the US Constitution does. As with the US Constitution, there are a lot of values and norms and ways people need to behave to make that thing work. Just words on paper doesn't do it. Same with Constitution and knowledge. If we get things right, I think we squash them like a bug. If we get things wrong, we're in deep trouble. Right now, we're, in the, we're getting things wrong, maybe moving in the right direction, I think. A partial exception, unfortunately, is academia. Here we are not seeing the kind of pushback that we need to on campus from people who favor intellectual diversity and real pluralism of viewpoint. Constitution of knowledge only works where there are multiple viewpoints because we can never see our own biases. It's human nature. We just can't do it. We always think we're right and know the truth. We can only find truth where there are people who disagree with us on everything. So you've got to have an open campus culture with plenty of diversity opinion and no political viewpoint being chilled and departments where everyone is welcome. Unfortunately, it's growing evidence that viewpoint and ideological discrimination is rampant on college campuses. We're seeing successful chilling. We're seeing university presidents and faculties who are not standing up for freedom of speech and freedom of thought. And increasingly, it breaks my heart, we're seeing students who favor the squelching of intellectual diversity in the name of protecting minorities. I'm a member of three historically persecuted minorities. I am an atheistic Jewish homosexual. I would not even be alive talking to you in an earlier age. I can tell you that the reason I'm married to a man today, a miracle, is because of freedom of thought, because of freedom of speech and the constitution of knowledge. We were able to answer their hateful fictions with our loving facts. So part of what I urge you all to do who are listening today is understand Think about the Constitution of Knowledge and think then about how you can defend it at Rhodes College. Thanks, John. That's, uh, that's a terrific summary, more than a summary of the book. It seems to me that one thing you're uh, saying, one thing you're arguing without precisely saying it is the Constitution of Knowledge can work, but it's got to be ratified. Uh, it's unwritten, but people have to subscribe to it. And one of the fascinating things about the book for me is, is it's a romp through philosophy of science, epistemology and social psychology, but all of which uh, culminates, I think, in this, in this point. You say, in effect, look, we're just not hardwired for truth seeking. And so we have to outwit our biases by hacking our tribal mind operating system, which always defaults to, to groupthink. And we can do that, you say, we're not simply incapable of thinking well, but only institutions can, can save us. There's a real emphasis on institutions in the, in the book. And this brings me to, to your analogy with Madisonian constitutionalism. You, you uh, cite Federalist 55, uh, importantly, in, in the book. And you say there that Look, the, this is Madison's view, the American constitution ultimately rests on some version of civic virtue, habits and norms like lawfulness, truthfulness, self-restraint. And in the same way, you say the constitution of knowledge does, but it's complicated because you've already established that our inveterate cognitive biases seem to put epistemic virtues beyond our reach. So again, institutions come to the, to the rescue. 
But you add, it's a very nuanced argument, you add, if we internalize and institutionalize the virtues of the Republic of Science, then the constitution of knowledge can work the same magic that Madison's constitution does. It's even more nuanced. So, so one last observation before you respond. You say both internalization of norms and the institutional uh, architecture are necessary, but you give more weight to the institutions. And you say this really interesting thing. We, I'm quoting, we must behave as if truth exists and evidence matters and preferably feel that way too. But this seems to mean finally that if we don't feel a concern for truth, we can rely on the knowledge system to channel us in the direction of behaving as if we actually did subscribe internally to the right, to the right norms. So I'm wondering just how much weight is put on this need to internalize the norms of the constitution of, of knowledge, which also leads to the question you know, how do we instill that, that virtue, right? Political constitutionalism has patriotism going for it as a fallback. People have a visceral love of country, that's, that's a resource. You've shown in the book that by nature, people don't love truth. This gets at, at, the, um, at your optimism, I guess. Well, boy, there's a there's a lot there in that wonderfully nuanced uh, question and analysis. And something I'm determined to do is try to be brief. So I won't do justice to all of that, but I want I want to get other voices in here. There are two questions. One is to what extent can we rely on institutions, even if we have not ourselves internalized the rules, the laws, the norms of the constitution knowledge? The answer to that is to some extent. I don't know to what extent. Uh, we know, to continue the analogy to the US Constitution, that you can have a certain number of people in a democracy who don't really believe in democracy, but as long as they'll follow the rules, you know, go to the polls, vote, not have a violent revolution, we're okay, right? But we also know there is a certain point at which if enough people don't believe in democracy, the rules, the institutions and norms will crumble because the civic basis for them will crumble. We don't know where that point is, and that's one reason we don't ever want to approach that point, which is, which is the reason why the January 6th riot was such a scary phenomenon. Um, the US Constitution has less of a purchase on a lot of American society than we thought. And I think the same may be true of the Constitution of Knowledge. So the safe thing to do is what Lincoln told us to do in his, his great Lyceum speech, another touchstone for my book. He says, we must internalize these values of the constitutions, the founders of the Republic are now dead. We can't just rely on their wisdom anymore. So we've got to internalize the rule of law. We've got to view it as almost a, a, a personal religion. But he says, we also have to get to a point where we don't even have to think about it, where we just do it because lawfulness is important. That's sort of the institutional side. So we've got to work both ends. We've got to strengthen the institution. We've got to strengthen the belief in the institution. So how do we do that? Over to you. Dan Cullen, you are teaching undergraduates, probably also graduate students at an American university. This is your job, right? You are inculcating generations of people as you were inculcated years ago in the norms, the habits, the civic virtues of the constitution of knowledge. This is how do you talk to someone in a way that is rational, that gives them handles, uh, rational handles to, to dispute your point? Will you let go of your point at some point, at least publicly? If the evidence doesn't support you, will you move on? Um, will you stand up for values like free speech and open inquiry, even if it leads to places you're not comfortable with? These are all the values that you are teaching or supposed to be teaching every day. And, and that's how we do it. And that's why I wrote this book. Yeah. I think one, one of the implications of your, of your book, John, is that um, it's just a, a scandal that American colleges and universities in their orientation programs, don't pay any attention, in my experience, to the fundamental questions of what it means to be joining a knowledge and learning community. We talk about all kinds of, of things, but we don't talk about 
what you're what you're entering into and what kinds of particular yeah well some colleges do uh purdue for example is including a first amendment module in its freshman orientation which is a great idea and some other colleges like chicago have begun stating their values up front, it's interesting that you sent me your course syllabus in which you try to do in basically a page and a half of prose what apparently a lot of universities and college aren't aren't doing, which is explaining to your class the very premises of the conversation they're about to have. So that's one way to do it. But I think you need more support for that than you're getting is what I hear you and many others saying. So, John, just one one more uh, follow up on this on this point about the individual before we turn to, to Jim and and Rebecca, you you make this really interesting and complex point. It's on page one fourteen for those who want to look about what membership in the reality based community is and is not, and you say it's not exclusive. There's room to be our personal, spiritual, embodied selves, each with our own experience and outlook. It, it seems analogous to me to our hyphenated American citizenship. You can be Italian American, African American, as long as you subscribe to the universal principles represented by whatever is the right side of the hyphen, equal rights, constitutionalism, you can, you can be something uh, compatible but different on the left side of the hyphen. Now, you say, though, that your private belief world, so to speak, which occupies that, that left side of the hyphen, not in a political sense, but just spatially, it also includes tradition, identity, rootedness, which hardly seems private. It, it seems like it's the very stuff of, of social life. And then you conclude with this really uh, interesting point. I'm, I'm quoting now, the virtue we need is not everybody to be truth seeking, but only that most people be truth friendly. So it's a less, dis, uh, less demanding standard. Um, and it, it brings to mind this, this passage from C.S. Peirce, uh, whom you, you uh, call on a lot. He says, the scientific spirit requires a man to be at all times ready to dump his whole cartload of beliefs in the moment experience is against them. That's the rigorous standard, right? For I suppose professionals in the, in the uh, reality-based community. But the or what does it mean for the ordinary person to not have to be truth seeking, but truth friendly? Could you just maybe give an example of, of that? Yeah, sure. Just to clarify, a term I often use in the book is reality-based community. And by that, I mean the people and institutions that are committed to the constitution of knowledge. And there are four big ones. There are a lot of small ones, but the four big ones are academia, science, and research, number one. That's your world, Dan. The second is the world of journalism, which is the world I come from. The third is um, the world of law. People don't realize it, but the idea of a fact arose in law, not in science, because you needed to have some factual premise to make decisions in court. And the fourth is government. You need government to run on principles that are reality-based. Otherwise, it's completely arbitrary, and you're, uh, you're marking up weather maps to change the course of a hurricane. A lot of people can get killed if you do that, by the way. So the point I'm making here is that the reality-based community is, for the most part, a specialized professional community. I mean, think of all the years you have to spend in training to become a lawyer, to get a PhD, to learn how to run a physics experiment, to understand how to make the arguments, structure the arguments in a philosophy paper, how to do peer review. All of these things require years of training and inculcation, often mastering a whole special vocabulary just to get into the conversation. We don't expect ordinary people to do that in their daily lives. And the good news is that in the constitutional knowledge, they don't have to. They just need to have enough trust in the basic legitimacy of the system and enough willingness to let its output stand as knowledge for public purposes so that we can get on with public life. So there may be people, I'm told there are people who believe Elvis Presley is alive and who even claim to know where he's living, but we don't send Elvis Presley a social security check. So the constitution of knowledge is a liberal system. Liberal comes from free. And one of the unique things about this system, including the US constitution, is they don't try to run our entire lives. 
We don't have divided government in the family. We don't have to have votes in the electoral college. Similarly, you can be a hardworking scientist following all the rules of the constitution of knowledge by day, and then go to church and pray. You're in a different world and no one there is going to say, well, what experiment have you run to prove that Jesus was re resurrected? So the constitution of knowledge doesn't structure our whole lives. It allows us to have these separate realms where we're in other kinds of epistemic communities. It's why the way the only system that does that, all the others are totalistic and absolutist. So how do we make these so apparent paradox work? The answer is you need enough people in society to be friendly to the constitution of knowledge without requiring everyone to observe it all the time. Right, thanks, John. I have to remind you, we're actually in Memphis, which is both an Elvis seeking and Elvis friendly community. <laughs> when I visited Rhodes College the first time, I went to um, Elvis's house. Was that in Nash? It's in that's in Memphis, right? Making it worse. Now. It's, oh no! You just need to stay stay off the Elvis topic for the rest of the afternoon. Uh oh. So another of your heroes in the book is Karl Popper, who said that uh, actually the, the truth seeking operation in practice is about error seeking. So let's invite Jim Stoner and Rebecca Tubell to join the conversation and see if they notice any errors that they want to bring up. We'll start with you, Jim. You're gonna. You're going to have to unmute. There you go. I think I have. Okay, good. I, I, I'm not uh, uh, usually introduced, Dan, as uh, now for error comes uh, <laughs> Stoner, but that's okay. Uh, it's, uh, it's an honor to be here, and thanks for inviting me to join this uh, conversation. Uh, I uh, was telling Jonathan earlier, I spent the weekend with this book, and I really uh, found it very interesting. I um, uh, like very much his strong constitutionalism at least with regard to Madison's or the American Constitution, one thing I find so troubling today is how readily uh, fellow friends of mine, scholars are to think themselves wiser than the Constitution and be uh, figure that in some way or another, it's on its way out. And, uh, uh, and, and we have to move into a, po or that we are already in a post-constitutional era. And so I'm all with you <laughs> in holding, uh, holding the constitutional line. And um, I liked as well, I, and you quoted my favorite Federalist Papers, uh, the, the line about Socrates, uh, if every Athenian um, were a Socrates, the Athenian assembly still would be a mob, which has been empirically proven, by the way, by faculty after faculty uh, at, uh, at, at, uh, in America. Um, I, I liked as well uh, your uh, linking of the Constitution to um, the free marketplace and to the development of modern science. I think you're right that those three uh, fit together. And I and and your description of troll culture and cancel uh, canceling despotism is really good. Those are the late two of the last chapters of the book, and uh, I recommend those to everyone. And of course, that's what you summarized here today. My concern, though, uh, is that you say that uh, our ten feet tall is working against troll culture, but not uh, it's not so clear that it's working against cancel culture. And of course, the concern among conservatives is that if it if it works against trolls, but not against cancel, it's just going to turn into its own troll that uh, that cancels uh, that cancels even further. But uh, but let's leave that aside for the moment. I want to what I want to talk about is the constitution of knowledge itself, the part that you uh, I think tongue in cheek said uh, you expect to last the next 5,000 years and replace uh, 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 Plato and Aristotle in a way. Uh, and here I think there's an equivocation in the book, which I want to invite you to clear up for me or uh, confess. And, and that is the equivocation concerning what it means when you, what you mean when you say reality based. At one point you, admit that by reality, you don't actually mean the sort of commonsensical meaning of reality, uh, what's out there, what really is as it is, what's there independent of, our, of ourselves, but rather objective reality insofar as it can be understood by building up all the propositions. Uh, there's a sentence which 
I, I, I can't wrap my mind around because I'm not quite sure what you meant by it, where you say we have no direct access to an objective world independent of our minds and senses. And what wasn't clear to me is whether you mean we have no access to the world outside of our minds and senses, or we have no access except through our minds and senses. If you mean through our minds and senses, that the, that the, sense, that the senses and the mind actually do grasp reality, then I'm with you and you're with Aristotle. But if what you meant is that all we have is what we build up in our mind and then in our collective mind through this community, there I think there's a real problem. And I want to I want to approach that by saying that what I think you're you're getting right about this constitution of knowledge is science, is modern science, uh, the um, the study of natural reality through the imperiological method, through the use of mathematics and observation uh, in regard to the mute things, the things that don't themselves have minds, the unintelligent beings of the world. And there, of course, we've seen enormous progress in understanding. Uh, you give some good examples in your book, and uh, uh, we have a faculty group that's been reading Darwin uh, at LSU in contrast to Aristotle, and that's been, it's, it's fascinating to read. I mean, to realize how how much we take for granted about the natural world today that is only really recently known. But I'm not so sure that, the, that, that these observations and that this const, the constitution of the natural sciences operates as well with regard to the human sciences. Uh, for, and, and then I think it, it, it doesn't really operate with regard to literary criticism or aesthetic criticism. You, you, Again, I'm not quite clear where you stand on that in the book. There was one passage on it. And, uh, and I don't think it operates in relation to philosophy itself. Um, uh, the social sciences, see, see when, when, when you're studying social sciences, studying human beings, it's not like you're trying to figure out from the outside or only from the outside uh, why they're acting as they are. Uh, there are two approaches, right? On the one hand, you can ask people, why did you do that? Why are you acting as you are? And you get their subjective perception. And then the social scientists add sometimes a, a sort of outside view, an objective uh, uh, sense of, of how people might appear that they might not see. And of course, you talk about that all the time. But it seems to me that these two approaches have to intermingle with one another. And when they do, the whole story is much more complex. So it's no accident that in the social sciences, there are really different schools. I'm hesitant to call them different sects, but I don't think there's nearly the same kind of consensus that develops in the sciences. And to claim there is a consensus can really distort what's going on. That's certainly true, it seems to me, with regard to aesthetic judgments. And then if reality is described in this way, this pragmatic way using purse as what we can wrap our minds around using the scientific method, then it seems there are things about the world uh, it, and about our own minds that we're going to miss, but that we nevertheless know, right? Logic itself is, uh, is, uh, is something understood since ancient times, even if the logic of scientific discovery that is of empirical work has been refined in, in modern eras. Questions about whether there is some unity to reality, which actually science supposes, right, uh, are the very questions that lead to theological inquiry. Uh, and, and yet those are ruled by this term reality-based as if they're unreal, uh, sort of in, in premise. Subjective experience uh, as, as portrayed in poetry and, uh, uh, and, uh, and, and literature uh, is devalued, it seems to me, even though I think subjectively we have a sense, and by we, I, I mean anyone who's really developed these talents or really read literature or studied, uh, uh, studied music or any of the, the fine arts, uh, a sense that there is a kind of approach to reality through those which goes beyond what is simply, uh, uh, what can be discovered ob objectively or externally. So, so I think that by conflating all of this into one constitution, 
you've really erased the differences between the branches, so to speak, if I can use this as a metaphor, and that these different branches of knowledge really operate in different ways and come to different kinds of consensus uh, in philosophy is maybe over the fundamental issues and presenting the different sides of those issues uh, and, and, uh, uh, and yet without achieving a kind of uh, agreement on realism versus idealism, for example. Uh, in, in the arts, again, there, is, uh, uh, there, there are differences about understanding the human person and, its, uh, it, it, and, and our, our sense of the whole and the way in which we govern our own lives. And, uh, and that's not going to be subject either to philosophic critique or limiting perhaps in the way of uh, philosophy to a certain set of alternatives. And it's not gonna be subject to uh, the establishment of, uh, of, of general consensus as uh, the empirical sciences seem to lead to. And so with that modification, I'm willing to say there can be a kind of constitution of knowledge, but I think that's always reaching towards reality itself. It is not, reality is not defined in terms of what the consensus is, but the consensus is always seeking reality and sometimes it's sought by consensus and sometimes it's sought by dispute. So I don't think there's as clear a solution. I do think that that means that some of our partisan differences are deeply grounded in our uh, sort of philosophic, the philosophic situation of the human being and of the human mind as imperfect in what it can know individually or collectively. Uh, and, uh, and consequently, that we could be seeking something that would actually suppress knowledge rather than um, promote it if we seek a kind of decision or consensus in the world of the mind, which we need in the world of law. Uh, but I don't think we need in the same way intellectually. Right, we're, we're doing heavy duty philosophy this afternoon. This is great. And uh, now let's, let's hear from the chair of the Rhodes Philosophy Department. Thank you so much. Thanks for being here, Jonathan. Happy to be here. Rebecca, why don't you just go ahead and answer Jim's questions? <laughs> Yeah, I think, uh, in fact, I will be be pulling from some similar uh, lines of questioning. So, so get ready for for more. Um, thank you for your important book, Jonathan. And I'll try to keep my comments to under ten minutes. So, at the heart of Jonathan's book is a vital call for dialogue across disagreement. And at stake is not only our shared ability to create knowledge, but really the very health of our democracy. That shared project of self-government, which requires fellow citizens to recognize each other as political equals. Simply put, the stakes are very high. And as I think you amply demonstrate, Jonathan, the obstacles are many. We face a great many challenges today to dialogue across disagreement. Uh, as you explain, political polarization leads each side to regard the other as, quote, evil, stupid, willfully ignorant, uninformed, irrational, biased. Uh, disinformation campaigns are at an all-time high, leading half of all people who rely primarily on Fox News to believe, as you note, that Bill Gates wants to use mass vaccination against COVID to implant microchips and track us all. Uh, efforts to cancel people who stray from orthodoxy are also more common than ever before, giving lie to the idea that even academic freedom remains protected. And so in my comments today, um, I'm going to suggest that threats to the pursuit of knowledge and to facts over fake news might be so formidable that greater viewpoint diversity not only could do little, but could even actively subvert the production of knowledge. Okay, so I'll start by noting that as I see it, the most concerning ele element of all, I think, is just how difficult it is for individuals to identify our own epistemic oversights, biases, and prejudices. 
So while most people are very likely to agree that others are <laughs> polarized and prejudging and um, prejudiced, they're far less likely to acknowledge the degree to which they themselves uh, might also be. And yet we know reliably that when any group of individuals is surrounded predominantly by like-minded people who they agree with, they're likely to endorse more radical versions of their commitments, not because more reasons have been presented to them, but simply because they've been repeatedly exposed to their pre-existing views. This is a fact con confirmed by a lot of research in social psychology, and I think it should alarm all of us. And I will admit that it took my own cancellation attempt, uh, which you describe in your book, uh, to truly appreciate just how hard it really can be to acknowledge the ways in which we ourselves are biased. Um, so briefly, it, uh, as, as some of you are undoubtedly aware, I published an article in 2017 um, entitled In Defense of Transracialism, uh, which is kind of the early defense of the coming argument in my uh, in my book. Um, and there I argue that, you know, it is both possible and given certain constraints, um, permissible to identify as a member of another race. I knew the article was controversial. My argument defended transracial identity by way of analogy to transgender identity. But I didn't anticipate the, the response and cancellation efforts I received from within academia. So calls for the journal to retract my article, which it didn't, um, and for me to be fired were just some features of the social media campaign against me. But the point is that prior to my own cancellation attempt, I think I believed that while some of the fears were valid, for the most part, fears about threats to academic freedom and you know, speech on campus had been grossly exaggerated. How did I come to that conclusion? Did I seriously engage evidence to the contrary? I don't think so. You know, if I read an article suggesting academic freedom was under threat, you know, I, I doubt I really read it uh, in the sense of opening myself up to the possibility of its claims being true probably rolled my eyes and looked at the source of the article. Oh, what's that? That's oh, not the New York Times, Wall Street Journal, probably crap, and <laughs> drew my conclusion. Uh, you know, it's shameful to admit, but I, you know, I think I, I was in uh, my own echo chamber. So that brings me to my first question for you, Jonathan, um, which pertains to uh, the distinction between echo chambers and epistemic bubbles. So at times you seem to treat echo chambers as if they are akin to epistemic bubbles. And I think that's a mistake. So the philosopher T. Nguyen describes the distinction as follows. He says that people in an epistemic bubble are just unaware of information that's been omitted from their sphere, whereas people in an echo chamber actively distrust information coming from outside sources. So if we think of two people who've been mostly exposed to anti-vaccination arguments, uh, and then those two people come across a pro-vaccination article, right? The person in the epistemic bubble might read that article with interest. It's a view they haven't yet been introduced to, and they're not hostile to it. They don't actively distrust you know, the source from which it's coming. The person in the echo chamber though, they're not going to read it, right? They, they'll have a very different reaction. Uh, they distrust the source from which the pro-vax argument comes. Maybe they'll hate read the argument, right? They're not gonna actually consider its claim. Okay, why am I belaboring this distinction? I think it really matters to at least part of your proposed solution, right? So among other things, you recommend that, quote, we go out and actively seek a variety of viewpoints. We find outlooks that make us uncomfortable thinkers who may seem strange, unorthodox, and unsafe, end quote. But if the major problem is of our time is a problem of echo chambers, not epistemic bubbles, then I don't think the solution comports with the diagnosis. Uh, in other words, the problem is far more insidious when it comes to the vast majority of people in a polarized context. So 
even if viewpoint diversity could be a good solution in the long run, it will probably just prove futile in the interim. And you know, you do note that you know homosexuals like yourself won the battle for uh, equality and same-sex marriage partly by exposing the flaws in homophobic arguments. But you but you also note elsewhere in the book that quote appeals to reason and evidence could persuade only after people had moved to a persuadable place emotionally by knowing gay people or couples or by a change of heart among friends or family, end quote. Actually, uh, yeah. So if you're right about that, then, then the challenge we face, I think, will require very different tactics of persuasion, which brings me to my second question for you, which is, if exposure to diverse viewpoints can't reliably persuade people to access truth or knowledge in our current context, then what is the argument against using other tactics of persuasion to encourage people toward greater knowledge? So as we've already noted, right, in an unhealthy epistemic environment, people believe for all kinds of horrible reasons or non-reasons, right? Group loyalties and biases and emotional appeals and characteristics of speakers and et cetera, et cetera. And related to that in an epistemically unhealthy environment, allowing the promulgation of certain ideas can result in people believing more false views, right? Which then leads also to demonstrable harms. I mean, you talk about several conspiracies in the book, but one that comes to mind is, you know, the idea that Hillary Clinton ran a child prostitution ring beneath a DC pizzeria, which led a gunman in to search for the children, right? Putting diners at risk. So the point is, right, if people believe for all sorts of bad reasons or non-reasons, and if what we're trying to do is avoid the creation of falsity above all else, why should we allow demonstrably false claims to gain any traction at all, right? Especially in a digital environment where those claims can have great reach. So you know, I'll, I'll, I'll say that, you know, maybe you'll mention, well, censoring ideas only further alienates the people who believe those ideas. It only deepens our divides, you know, more. Um, but I found it interesting that you, you express some support for the idea of social media companies or for social media companies rather, who have put a, this is, has been disputed marker on demonstrably false claims, right? Well, my sense is that when a user receives a this has been disputed alert, it won't cause that user to change their views, right? They're in an echo chamber, not an epistemic bubble for all in all likelihood. Rather, they're likely to just seek out their own online sphere where they're less likely to be censored. So then the question remains, right? If if it's okay to permit social media companies to flag certain claims as disputed, despite the fact that that's going to likely alienate people who believe those claims, then why not just permit those companies to just remove those claims from the digital landscape entirely? Like what's the argument for not just going the, the whole way? And I'll, uh, I'm almost done, uh, but, but I wanna return to the topic of canceling here because I think this is how you could actually work out a, a sort of defense of, of canceling. You know, at one point in the, the book, you suggest that canceling is, quote, not fundamentally about the ideas or even the people it targets. It's about virtue signaling and bonding with your group, end quote. But I think that might be an overly narrow definition of canceling. So, you know, could there not be multiple reasons for canceling? Could there not be virtuous reasons for canceling, even virtuous epistemic or truth motivated reasons, right? So many cancers will claim they're deeply worried about certain false ideas gaining traction, right? Ideas so dangerous that the, the best way, maybe the only way to stop them would be to cancel the people who promulgate them, especially if those people have a lot of influence. So again, if our ultimate concern is, you know, the creation of knowledge, um, why not cancel Alex Jones or other conspiracy theorists whose dissemination of manifestly absurd ideas has led to demonstrable rise in falsity and rise in, uh, you know, even physical harm uh, resulting from those ideas. Uh, you know, and I can imagine responses you might give, well, it's strategically misguided, you know, it draws more attention to the cancelers, uh, to the to the cancelled idea. 
I think that's probably true a lot of the time, but I also think we couldn't know how many ideas haven't gotten off the ground <laughs> because canceling was successful in those cases, right? Anyway, uh, you'll probably think it's ironic that I'm giving a kind of defense of canceling having been on the receiving end of it, but it is all in the spirit of your book, which is that we can't get to the truth uh, or to better knowledge without taking seriously the collision of uh, ideas or as Mill says, right, truth emerges in its collision with error. So those are my comments. Thank you for your for your important book. Well, John, those were not exactly softball questions. Um, let's give you a chance to respond. No, and it, it looks like there are 21 there are questions of... in the in the queue. So I'm going to fail to do justice to all of that by trying to respond in in more in haiku like suggestive ways, because there's so much there and it's so deep and important. So um, starting with uh, Professor Stoner. Do you prefer Jim or James? I should have asked. <laughs> we'll call you Pro Professor Stone. I, I go by Jim. <laughs> Jim, <laughs> if yeah. If you call me Professor, you count me in the Constitution of Knowledge, and that's what we're arguing about. All right. So, <laughs> uh, <laughs> so uh, starting with Jim, point number one, uh, he's worried that my account of reality uh, does not settle the question of whether there's a metaphysical truth out there to be reached. And that's right. I, I don't know and I don't care. The metaphysics of the situation don't concern me. I'm concerned with the system we use as a society to reach our closest approximation of truth. And that's objective knowledge. And whether you think we can ever actually get there or not, I will leave to all of you because the process of trying will be the same either way. Um, a more fundamental complaint and a place where I think, Jim, you and I just disagree is I make a very audacious claim in this book and I'm sticking with it which is that, yeah, it is true that there are sciences like chemistry, which are better at crisply adjudicating disputes about facts, about knowledge, truth. Um, and there are ones that are less capable of crisply adjudicating those disputes. Those might be literary criticism or for that matter, moral disputes. But my claim is that the constitution of knowledge is unique because it can organize all of those disputes in a constructive way such that those disputes are waged in ways that do not lead to civil war, violence, killing, oppression, government, fiat, and ignorance. And I give in the book as an example of that. Uh, I think we have achieved some knowledge in an aesthetic question. For example, is Hamlet a greater play than Titus Andronicus? There's all kinds of evidence and arguments that have been adduced to that. And there's a very strong consensus that it's right to the point where it would be ludicrous to argue otherwise, though I guess someone could do it. So the point isn't that every dispute is resolvable, it's that the constitution of knowledge is a social way of organizing these conversations that lead us toward knowledge. And in any liberal society that uses it, I believe in all of these fields, you will find evidence of progress toward greater enlightenment over time, if only in the form of uh, more refined ways of talking about things. I think that's the business you're in. That's why I include journalism and literary criticism and, and moral criticism and, and all the rest the constitution of knowledge, and it's why as an American homosexual, I believe we made moral progress. We gained moral knowledge as a result of the moral examination that was organized the way it was. So yeah, I think it organizes everything. It doesn't resolve everything, but it organizes everything. Um, Rebecca, so there's, I think there's a common, there are a couple things there, um, and a common element. There's a smaller point, which are, are echo chambers different from epistemic bubbles? Maybe they are. Uh, there are specialists who concern themselves with those things and other things, for example, spirals of silence, preference falsification. These are all ways to manipulate the social environment uh, to make it more difficult to discern fact from fiction. And they all work. They exploit various cognitive deficiencies and vulnerabilities that we have. Um, and I don't think it's as important to try to distinguish the fine tactics and responses to each as it is to understand the general principle of what's going on here, which is to game the system in a way that causes us to become confused, demoralized, unsure who's right and who's wrong, who to believe, what people really think, and so on. 
Uh, and they all lead to similar effects, which is what I call zombie science, which is when people think they're discovering truth, but they're in fact just hearing themselves talk back to themselves. Spirals of silence, which is when people go silent because they think no one agrees with them, even though maybe everyone actually, or almost everyone agrees with them and so on. They're all forms of information warfare. The, the bigger point that I think you're making, if I understand it, is are there conditions where diversity works against objective knowledge and where allowing falsity does the same thing? And the answer is, of course, yes. Outside the constitution of knowledge, diversity of opinion leads to chaos, which tend, then tends to lead into to sectarianism and repression and warfare. Just as outside the US constitution over history, diversity of political preference tended to lead to warfare, violence, oppression, dictatorship. Um, it's all in the structure. The, the thing that's so important about the constitution of knowledge is that it provides a social structure, a set of institutions and norms that channel that diversity into productive conversations by giving us incentives to perform them in a certain way, adducing empirical evidence, for example, in ways that will convince other people, abiding generally by the results of, of those conversations, for example, giving people prizes if they turn out to be really good at that, making major headway, disciplining people occasionally when they cheat, for example, if they falsify. All of these things and many more are the structures which convert the chaos of diversity into the power to compare, contrast, and evaluate ideas in a forward moving way. So yeah, of course, diversity can be a downside. It usually is. You need a system to channel it. That's the US constitution. It's the constitution of knowledge. Um, why not let social media remove stuff that's harmful? Well, they do, and they can, of course. They're doing that right today on vaccination. They did it in the election. You can't get on Facebook and say vote November 4th when election day is November 3rd. Uh, to me, it's an empirical question how well that works. I'm wary of it because I'm not sure it'll work all that well. There are more sophisticated ways to handle it, and those are disamplification. That, by the way, is primarily how science works. You don't throw someone in jail for being wrong or saying stupid stuff. You marginalize them, and no one listens to them, and their ideas pretty much, you know, they die on the vine. They, you know, one, no one invests money to do the research. If you go to try to go to conferences, no one listens. Um, social media companies are looking for equivalents of that ways to disamplify and slow stuff down, as they call it, not freedom of speech, but freedom of reach. Um, and that's also what journalism does, right? I mean, any old person can't talk in the newspaper. You have to get edited. We don't call that censorship. We call that editorial decision making. So it's going to be a mixture of all these tools. We don't know what the answer is yet. It's a very, it's a wicked hard problem, the problem of social media. Are there multiple reasons for canceling? Uh, for wanting to silence people, including virtuous reasons? Of course there are. Uh, no dispute there. Uh, again, any American homosexual will tell you that the people who wanted to keep us in the closet, fire us from our jobs, who condemned us as a stench in the, in the, uh, in the nostrils of God, who didn't want us to marry or serve in the military, they all thought they were saving the country from, from you know, a hideous moral and political and social problem. They thought we were going to recruit their children. So yeah, they were acting virtuously, but they were also acting wrongly. And it's the constitution of knowledge that reveals those flaws. Um, so if you want to reveal those flaws, and if you want to get at the, at the wrongful ideas uh, that do the harm, then you shouldn't have the canceling. The canceling is not going to work. Uh, I use canceling in a specific way. I define it carefully. It's not just criticism, right? It's not just saying Rebecca Tubell's wrong. I don't think you would have minded that in the least. I think you would have welcomed that. It's saying this person needs to be punished shamed, ostracized, deprived of her livelihood, made so that she can never work again, have her reputation demolished, so that next time anyone Googles her, they'll see she's a racist. These are ways of violating a first principle of the Constitution of Knowledge, which is we kill our hypotheses instead of each other. When you start going after the individual and trying to punish that person, then you're outside the realm of the Constitution of Knowledge. Thanks for that, Jonathan. Uh, we've got a, a host of really excellent questions and, and mostly from, from students, many of whom have, have read your book. One you, I think, already answered, but it was one of the, the first ones, so I'll, I'll mention it again. And that is, 
what, if any, limits do you um, think are necessary to apply to, to, or that social media must abide by as opposed to the, to the government? And if not censoring content on their, on their platforms, at least regulating. So they have no choice but to regulate content. Um, they always have regulated content. The notion that so-called platforms are just open marketplaces was never true. They were always using algorithms that decided what to present to us. They were just using algorithms that favored falsehood over truth because falsehood spreads faster and it's much easier and cheaper to coin and it's outrageous. So now they're working on systems that will try to change the incentives, figure out if there are ways to amplify stuff that tends to be truer instead of stuff that tends to be falser, stuff that's less outrageous. Interstitial warnings, which I think one of the two of you mentioned, these are the pop-ups that slow you down, just provide some friction before you retreat stuff that's, that's false or harmful. Some of this is going to be just old fashioned, what we call in my business editing. You know, you, it's, it's our platform, you can't say that here. More of it's going to be system redesign and policy resign. And it's not going to look the same way in any two places. The good news is that five years ago, the barons of social media land were saying, this is not our problem. It's all just free speech marketplace of ideas. It'll take care of itself. We now know that that's not true. And so they're now doing the same process that was done in journalism 100 years ago and in science 200 years ago, which is beginning to try to create some structures and norms to channel us when we're using these media in constructive pro-social ways. That's a hard thing to do, but it's not the first time humanity has had to face that challenge. So uh, we, we have a raft of questions on the theme of cancel culture, which um, I wanna to get to, but I also wanna acknowledge a couple of questions on the epistemology front. So, uh, I may have to bundle some of some of these into into one question. Someone asked, "Is is Wikipedia an example of the constitution of knowledge working as as it should?" That's an easy one. The answer is yes. There's a whole section in my book about Wikipedia, which turns out to have done an amazingly jo good job of adapting the rules of the traditional constitution of knowledge to an internet-based community. It's all volunteers. It's based on norms and institutions and hierarchies and structures that the community agrees to and that work incredibly well. And to me, it's a very hopeful sign. Now, you know, Twitter is not an encyclopedia. It's, it's not about finding uh, and listing knowledge. It does other things. But Wikipedia is a case in point that the principles that have served us well for the last two to 300 years can and do work online. There's a whole section about that in the book for those of you who are considering picking up, picking up the book. And certainly, Dan, I have to say, this is the first time my book has been described as a romp. So I think I'm gonna use that in the publicity. Yeah. Um, so here's, here's another one and, and uh, full disclosure, this is, this is from uh, one of my colleagues who is an epistemologist. Uh, uh -oh. Conspiracy theorists often invoke appeals to intellectual autonomy when peddling their wares. For example, think for yourself or follow the breadcrumbs and so on. He says, I take it that intellectual autonomy plays some role in the constitution of knowledge. Do you see anything especially troubling about these sorts of appeals to intellectual autonomy? Is a recognition of our intellectual dependency, the fact that we can't help but rely on others for most of what we know, a corrective? Uh, that's a, again, that's an easy one. The answer, I think, is yes. My book draws very heavily on, on the work of, I think, the greatest American philosopher, Charles Sanders Peirce. And one of the things that he said is that individuality and falsity are one and the same. He makes the point that it really doesn't matter what an individual believes. It's only when that is checked by others who are no one in particular, by any reasonable observer, that the process of developing knowledge of science gets underway. There's, you know, Imagine a man with disheveled hair, scribbling notes um, in a Garrett apartment in Zurich, Switzerland in the late, uh, late 1800s. Um, is, is he a madman or is he Albert Einstein, a genius? You can't tell even in principle until that's put through the rigorous process of the constitution of knowledge. That's the structure we've been talking about. All of the incentives, all the pumps and filters that acquire ideas say, is it worth researching this? Do we peer review it? Who do we send it to? Do we pass it along through the network? So uh, yeah, 
autonomy is important, freedom of speech and thought is important, but it's only the input. The output depends on getting the rest of the system right. So here's a, here's a related question. Uh, it's, it's become a, a trope, right, to, to refer to follow the science. And in your view and Peirce's view about knowledge not really being a personal possession of anyone, should we, should we drop the definite article? Because it's not as though the president can say, bring me the science, and someone goes to a CDC vault with white gloves on and, and comes back with, with the science. Are we, are we making a mistake, just you know, those of us ordinary, ordinary people who have an idea of, of the science as though it can be authoritatively delivered by name your name your scientist or or professional like Anthony Anthony Fauci. You see what I mean? Yeah, uh, follow the science is a phrase I don't particularly use, and I understand where it's coming from though. But you know there there are lots of cases as we all know, where we're short of a consensus in science. Science is a process, right? Um, and one of the things it does is embody disagreements that are working themselves out. And there's no central authority. There's no Supreme Court in science to make these decisions. So when have we reached a consensus about something like climate change? When have we even reached a consensus about whether there is a consensus? Well, these are ongoing debates and that makes it really hard. That said, there are some disputes like, is smoking cigarettes bad for you? Uh, I think now the fact of, of human caused climate change is in this category where I think it's safe to say that pretty much any reasonable test of scientific consensus has been met. Um, now it doesn't mean that people can't, answer, can't ask questions about it, but I think if what follow the science means is generally try to prefer the consensus views of people inside the reality-based community who are following the constitution of knowledge to the people of random friends and family, then yeah, I agree with it. So we, we have so many good questions left. I'm, I'm going to extend our, our time uh, to 529. We're all gonna disappear uh, at, at 530. Um, we, we have to, and John, I'll ask you to, to maybe I don't want to say soundbite, but um, be uh, shorter. I'll try shorter so we can pick up as, as many of these. How would you distinguish between a safe space and a brave space? You know, you know those terms. I, I kind of, I kind of know those terms. Um, well, intellectually, I'm against safe spaces. I think the whole point of the Constitution of Knowledge is that it requires to get out of our comfort zone and confront ideas and people that we disagree with. It gives us a lot of protection in the form of a lot of rules and protocols that discourage conduct that's you know, simply hateful or individually targeted. That's, that's why academic articles don't begin with, with personal attacks. That gets you marginalized. Uh, I think that the constitution of knowledge is the brave space. Um, it's, it's hard to be there. We forget this. It exposes, forces us to expose ourselves to criticism every day to offensive ideas, because you know they might be right where they might contribute to finding out who's right. And you have to be brave to be there. And that's one of the reasons I wrote this book to remind people constitution of knowledge doesn't take care of itself. It does require some courage and some fortitude and some understanding of some rules that are hard to get ourselves and our friends to obey. Here's a question about stand-up comedy. Uh, so hmm. Started uh, pulling certain jokes out of their repertoire out of fear of being canceled, even though their jokes are meant to be taken, obviously satirically. Satirically, does this, in your view, fall under the umbrella of cancel culture, or is it is it something else? Well, I try to use cancel culture in a. Uh, I, I call it um, coercive conformity is the word I used before cancel culture came. I try to use it in a fairly fairly narrow specific sense which is the deliberate use of social coercion to silence and intimidate and manipulate the information environment. And I think telling a comedian that she's being offensive and you don't wanna hear it does probably does not fall in that space. On the other hand, I'd rather live in a culture that has more leeway than less leeway. And um, my idea of civility is yes, it's important to try not to offend people, but it's also just as important, if not more important to try not to take offense. 
people now who are teaching, you guys tell me, but they tell me that a lot of students now will go out of their way to be offended, to wear their, their sensibilities uh, on the outside and to be ungenerous about that. And that is not a good culture if you want a robust intellectual environment where learning takes place. Um, here's another one. So what are the limits of, uh, on free speech according to the perspective of the constitution of knowledge? Pretty much the ones the Supreme Court have outlined are pretty good. We have a stable, well-articulated law, First Amendment law in the US, and it not saying that that law applies to say a private university like Rhodes, but I am saying that actually it's a pretty good setup. It says there are things you can't do like commit fraud, direct personal threats, targeted harassment, um, conspiracy, sedition. There's a list of things you can't do and they're pretty well understood and defined. And I think that's actually a pretty good place to draw the line. And in general, private colleges, if someone on campus is, um, expressing, a, a making an expression or speech or opinion that falls within ordinary First Amendment protections, one of the things universities should say is, we will not even investigate that. Uh, University of Chicago just did that when a, a campaign came up to try to fire someone who had expressed a conservative view on Twitter. The president of the university just said, you know what, we believe in free speech. That's what this person was doing. There's nothing here to investigate. Go away. I wish more universities would do that. Well, I think you may have answered this next question, but I'll ask it anyway, because it has to do with your alma mater, Yale, and it's a reference to uh -oh. the controversy. That's even more dangerous for me than, than Elvis, I think. Over the, yeah, you're, you're not going anywhere near there. Um, the, the dispute over Halloween costumes, which I think everybody uh, is probably aware of, but Yale's response to it, um, what would you what would you have said and done? Let me put it this way: Had you been uh, Peter Salove, president of Yale, I would probably not have rewarded the students who surrounded a professor and berated him in an intimidating fashion, using not only hostile language but epithets. I probably would not have rewarded them with academic prizes, for example. Um, I would have, as president of the university, I would have gone out of my way to, um, to express respect and admiration and support for the calm and cool way in which Nicholas Christakis, the professor who was in that situation, responded. Um, and I would remind the student body that um, at this university, we do not use coercion and intimidation when we encounter views. Um, that are contrary to our own. Um, I would have sent signals like that instead of the kinds of signals that it seems like Yale sent. So this next question in a way follows up on that. Do you, do you think cancellation is ever warranted? Um, if you mean deliberate campaigns to target people and drive them from polite society, Maybe I could think of extreme cases, but I'm reluctant to do that because it's, they'll be so quickly abused. I mean, the first case of this that I knew about, I didn't realize at the time it was such a harbinger of things to come, but it was 2014, a man named Brandon Ike, who was named CEO of Mozilla. Some people found out that he had given $1,000 in support of an anti-gay marriage initiative in California six years earlier. This was at a time when Barack Obama opposed same-sex marriage. Um, and there was a campaign to get him fired. And um, within days, he was fired. He lost his job. The company issued an apology. Um, and people said that's because it's hate speech to oppose same-sex marriage. Yet, as I was recently informed at Rhodes College, the first time I was there in 2004, there were people who wanted me canceled because they thought being for same-sex marriage was hate speech. So basically, no, this is not the universe that, that I want to live in. I want to live in a universe where people will confront the ideas People remember, you know, when, when you confront some obnoxious or offensive idea, try to, try to dial your reaction down to annoyance instead of up to outrage, because you do have that choice. Ignore the person, marginalize them, laugh at them. Something we know from gay culture is I mean, nothing really works better than satire and just mocking these people, but ignore them. So uh, picking up on that, I think this is, this is a way of um, asking about the theme of, of several other questions. 
in back in 2014, you and and a dozen other well-known advocates for the legalization of same-sex marriage uh, published uh, a letter in which you asked, is opposition to same-sex marriage by itself expressed in a political campaign beyond the pale of tolerable discourse in a free society? And obviously you meant that rhetorically, right? But in a, in a New York Times op-ed that closely followed one of, one of yours, one of the people who launched the campaign against Bren, uh, Brendan Eich, Chris Rutter, also a CEO uh, of another tech company, or online dating company actually, uh, wrote, wrote this, said it, it's unfortunate that an individual should suffer for his private beliefs. But in the case of Brendan Eich, those beliefs amount to little more than bald cruelty. Opposing gay marriage is selfish and wrong. It denies other people happiness to satisfy your own opinion of how the world should be. Unlike, say, opposition to gun control or publicly funded health care, opposition to gay marriage is in politics. It's just prejudice. Now, there are a lot of uh, things problematic with, with his formulation, but if we updated it, I think it might, it might come down to this. Look, opposition to same-sex marriage is essentially hate speech. It's a denial of the humanity of LGBT people. It's, so it's not just a private prejudice, it's already an act of discrimination. That's the, the argument one, one hears now. And so it shouldn't be shielded by the First Amendment because it's not, it's not ultimately speech. It's doing something, it's discrimination. It's a 14th Amendment violation. That I think is, is perhaps the, um, the most significant argument out there now on, on, the, on the other side. What, what's, your, what's your response to it? Well, there's, there's a lot to say about that. In the interest of brevity, I'll, I'll answer it from my own life. So hate speech is, entirely in the eye of the beholder. It's, it's hate speech that someone hates. It's not an independent category out there. Same is true for discriminatory speech and verbal violence and all of these other terms that people use. I can tell you, having spent 30 years as a gay rights activist and a gay marriage advocate, that when we started out, we were the hate speakers because we hated America, we hated America's children, um, and so forth. If, if there had been hate speech laws, they would have been used against us. I can also tell you that you don't battle hate by banning hate speech any more than you ban, than you fight global warming by breaking all the thermometers. Um, the reason that, that we have hate speech, the problem isn't the speech, it's the hate. And it's not that people get up every morning and say, who can I hate on? This goes to a point that Rebecca made earlier. It's because Hate comes from ignorance and fear. That's why they went after homosexuals and blacks and women, ignorant, bad ideas. The hate speech, so-called, helped us gay people because it gave us the opportunity to show our arguments were better. It showed us where our opponents were. We used it to catapult our moral campaign and to expose their flaws. Minorities are always better off in a society that protects hate speech than in a society that protects us from hate speech. And I would also point out that we were oppressed as blacks and women and other minorities have been oppressed on the grounds that we were fragile. We needed the protection. We'll fall apart if we encounter offensive or hateful speech. Well, wrong, we are strong. We will not back down if you happen to criticize or offend us. We'll give you a piece of our mind and we don't need to be patronized or condescended to. So please don't protect us. So one last question, uh, John. Uh, how does one become a, success, a successful truth seeker? I'll let you know if I learn. Uh, all I can tell you is that when I wrote this book about the constitution and knowledge, the reality-based community, it's because I have spent my life and my professional career trying to learn 
the rules and protocols and norms of my community, the reality-based community, my branch of that community, which is journalism, and tried to become better at it, tried to learn how to listen, how to respond to arguments, um, rather than simply to individuals, how to make discoveries. And this has been the great ennobling quest of my life. I'm still working on it. I'm still trying to get better at it. But, but every day I get up and thank my lucky stars that I am able to be part of the reality seeking project. Jonathan, By the way, I think that's true of everyone on this call. I was just about to say, Jonathan Rausch, Jim Stoner, Rebecca Tuvel, and all of you who participated today, thanks so much for a, a great conversation. And read this book, it really is a romp. Um, Aphoristic, funny, and uh, resurrects the reputation of C.S. Peirce, who uh, America's greatest philosopher who died in obscurity and, and, and poverty. Um, the, uh, the, book is, the book is better than the movie, available at bookstores near you. And I can't thank you enough, Dan, and also Rebecca and Jim, for taking time out of your busy schedule to be here um, and embark on this quest with me. It's, it's a great privilege, a great honor. Thanks so much. See you soon.